Good morning, Geyer Springs. Welcome to worship. My name is Shelley Barnes and I'm the women's director here. Geyer women, we have some exciting opportunities for you starting in January. These offerings are for women of all ages and stages, including various Bible studies, such as Jesus and Women, God of the Covenant, and Boundaries and Goodbyes. We also have small groups for moms, such as Refresh and Mothers Parenting Adult Children, and lastly, for women whose husbands have passed away, and that one's called Naomi's Circle. Please check out the days and the times for these groups at gsfbc.org women. Don't forget our candlelight Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. and our candlelight Christmas Day service at 10.30 a.m. There will be no Sunday school on Christmas Day. And lastly, there will be no Wednesday activities until January the 11th. Once again, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to worship. Good morning and Merry Christmas. It is so good to see you this morning. We're so delighted that you chose to be here for worship this morning. And if you're online, we want to say welcome to you as well. Tis the season. And by the way, if you hadn't bought it, you're in trouble. Okay, I'll just go ahead and get that out of there. Some of your, your prayer lives this morning are increasing because you have forgotten the gift to get. And that's okay. The greatest gift certainly is the Lord. That's why we're here. And that's why we want to worship Him this morning. And we're so excited to be able to do that. When you walked in to receive a worship guide, it looks like this. I want to invite you to take a look at some of the happenings that are taking place. You heard our women's ministry director, Shelley, talk about women's ministry, our Christmas Eve service and Christmas Day service. Just want to remind you that those services, as you're preparing for your family to come in and kind of your weekend, we hope that you'll choose one of those services. They are identical, and so if you want to come to both, we certainly would like to have you at both, but we just want you to be aware, choose one, as uh, we are looking forward to seeing you and your family this holiday season. On the far right side of that worship guide is a little tab. On the top of it says connect, and that's exactly what we want to do with you and your family as we want to connect with you. So we invite you to do one of two things. You can fill this paper form out, tear it away at the end of the service, take this tab, drop it in the basket at the exit door, and That'll be a, a record of your attendance, but also there's an opportunity to put a prayer request or ask questions about today's sermon or questions about ministry. Our team and our staff will pray for you and we'll get back with you on how we can serve you and your family. If you are a master at technology, you can certainly use a QR code and use your phone this morning to do the very same thing. Our staff will get the same information. We invite you to do one of those two things so that we can connect with you this morning. Our desire here at Geyer Springs is to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. And we celebrate those who are being discipled to salvation, but then also being discipled to baptism. This morning. We have one who's come this morning to tell her church that she knows Christ as Savior. So I want to draw your attention to the baptistry this morning. Well, good morning, church. As we think about brand new life in Jesus Christ, when Christ came as we celebrate during this Christmas season, he actually came to give us something, but to take something away from us. He came to take away the penalty of sin as he absorbed that upon himself on the cross. But he also came to give us his righteousness and his eternal life. And we see a picture of that this morning in my friend Annie Sutton. Annie is in our children's ministry in the fifth grade. And she is coming to let you know that Christ has taken away her penalty of sin, but has given her eternal life through what he has done on the cross. 
Annie has trusted Christ for a while, but this summer at JoyWorks, our worship arts camp, she began to ask more questions about baptism and was convicted that that was something that she needed to do. And so if you're a friend, you're a family member, or you are with Annie at midweek or Sunday school, I wanna invite you to stand now in support of the Lord's work in her life and her response to God's work in her life. It's so good to see ask that you would join me in praying for Annie and her walk with the Lord, that she would grow to be such a strong disciple in Christ and point many, many people to him. So Annie, I'm going to ask you in front of everyone here so that you have the opportunity to publicly proclaim your faith in Jesus Christ. Have you put your trust and faith in the Lord to save you from your sins? Upon that profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. you'll take a moment and bow with me as we pray and as we continue to prepare our hearts for worship. This morning you may be sitting there and you have felt stirred in your own spirit, wondering where you may be in your relationship with Christ. At the conclusion of the service today, we'll have pastors available to visit with you and share with you the life-changing grace that is brought to us through Jesus Christ and what we celebrate this Christmas season. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you for Annie. Thank you for your work in her life. Thank you for her family who have planted the seeds of the gospel in her heart and the church body who has come along to water those seeds. But we can't bring the growth, that was you. And so thank you for saving her soul and I pray that you will build her up in Christ and that she will glorify you. Lord, today as we gather together, we're gonna be giving to you we're going to be praising you. We're going to be sitting under the preaching of your word. And I pray that every moment of this service would point towards you and be glorifying to you. For those that are in the room this morning that are hurting in a difficult season of their life, would you, Holy Spirit, comfort them as your word says that you can do. And I also pray for those who are stirred in their own spirit that they may need to get things right with you, that you would draw their hearts to you. And for those in the room, they are saved and they have trusted you, Lord. Would you gather us together this morning as this church body and help us to sing like it. Thank you for this Christmas season, Christ. Let us remember what you have done and praise your name for it. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Through love, what a love. 
Thank you, church. Would you stand with us as we worship this morning? We celebrate the newborn king. Hark the herald, angels sing glory to the newborn king. Lift your voice with us today. Hark the herald, angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy. to save, Son of God, Son of Man, Prince of Peace, and Lord of all. This is Jesus whom we celebrate. Night of wonder, still and silent, heaven's brilliance from above. Light of glory, pierce the darkness, mercy pierce my heart with love. This is Jesus, King of glory, here to rescue from the fall. Son of God, who comes to save us, Prince of peace and Lord of all. Lord of mystery.
Donovan and Abby Sims family comes to share the advent. Good morning. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We light this candle today because of the peace we find in the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. He is the wonderful counselor, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Oh, oh, oh. 
Worship you, God, for you are Emmanuel. God, you are Prince of Peace. God, you are wonderful, counselor, everlasting Father. God, and so much more. Father, we celebrate Jesus today. God, we thank you for all that you are to us. And we love you. And we worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. school. 
Compassion reached out to the world and gave us joy beyond measure. Then compassion was crucified to reveal heaven's treasure. Oh, destroying the sting of death, Jesus conquered the Thank you, Lamona and Sean. What a wonderful picture of the glory of God in his birth. Well, welcome. Pastor Dave is, uh, is upstairs in the venue preaching up there. So if you want to hear a good sermon, go ahead and head out. It's fine. <laughs> if you are here, we would do want to say welcome. If you're online, we would say this. We love you. We're glad that you're online. If you are able body, we would love to see your face in person. We feel like community in the flesh is better than community through a screen. And so we just want to love you and your family the best way we can. And from my family to yours, what a very Merry Christmas it's already been. And in case you're wondering, Argentina, Argentina is up 2-0 against France in the World Cup. <laughs> Not that I looked at that over there. Don't look. We are glad that you were here today. When I was a student pastor, uh, I was a student pastor for 16 years, and it's kind, of, it's kind of strange that I'm our executive pastor now because I think God has a sense of humor. But at 16 years, as a student pastor, I really enjoyed a lot of things. One of those things I used to do was really enjoy uh, playing uh, games with our students. And one of my favorite games we called uh, was Rumors. And what we would do is we would line up students in two lines, parallel lines, and we would hand the first student of the line a card. And on that card read a sentence, and it could be something like this, that Peter had a pumpkin that he would sell every October in the market. <laughs> <laughs> 
And they would take that sentence and they would pull that card away and then they were supposed to whisper to the person next to them what they could remember from that sentence. And they would do so on, on, from one person to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And, and inevitably the winner of the game would be the one line that was most accurate at the end of the line. But inevitably, as eighth graders do, they mangled the sentence horribly. And so it turned out that Peter had a pumpkin that he would sell every October at the market. Would inevitably be something like this, like Pastor Dave is wildly jealous of Pastor John's manly beard or something like that, right? <laughs> and so it's interesting because teenagers sometimes forget the details. And I am a parent of teenagers and I, would lo I love it when they come to me and go, Dad. And I'm like, what? Something very important I was supposed to tell you, but I cannot remember what it was. <laughs> and I'll go, that doesn't help me at all, friend. Teenagers often forget the details. And I think sometimes we do that with the Christmas story. We've allowed tradition or song or our favorite play to affect the truth of Christmas. Now, holiday traditions have overshadowed our holy day truth. And so knowing the truth of Christmas is important. It helps us have a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus and his birth. And it certainly helps us to defend the truth of Christmas as we know the truth of Christmas to those out there who may be doubters and skeptics. And so we are in the middle of a, of a new series called The Case for Christmas. And we're going to take an in-depth look this morning at some misconceptions around the Christmas narrative. And the idea being that we, we hope to really bolster our understanding of the Christmas story, but we want to be equipped to defend the Christmas story and the reliability of the Bible. So if you're taking notes this morning, today's message is entitled Holiday or Holy Day, The Truth of Christmas. And I want to unpack a few popular assumptions about the story and then take a little walk into some applications about the story this morning. Now, the Christmas narrative is, is told in a couple of different places. It's told in Matthew uh, chapter 1 and 2, but it's also told in Luke chapter 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to, to turn to Luke chapter 2. Now, both Gospels support the story in very unique ways. They don't contradict one another, but Matthew focuses on the story from a, from a Joseph perspective, and Luke will focus the story on a Mary perspective. And as we turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 2, if you want to get ahead, we're also going to be in Hebrews chapter 4. So if you want to find that, put your finger there, that's fine. But in Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to begin this morning as we talk about holiday or holy day, the truth of Christmas. And I'm going to read the first seven verses. The scripture says, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them at the inn." Now, this morning, as we unpack some assumptions, it, it, some of this you will know, some of this you'll be reminded of, and some of this you'll, you'll start thinking bad thoughts about the assumptions because you may have fallen into the trap of allowing our holiday to supersede the truth of the holy day. And it could have been a song or a carol or a Christmas play or the 1.2 million Hallmark movies that are online right now that you could watch. And we begin to, to watch and, and invest in those things, and, and slowly but surely over time it begins to take away the truth of the Scripture. So before we begin about some assumptions, this may cost you a little bit, and here's what I mean. Some of your decorations are biblically inaccurate, and that's okay. It's okay. We can have a scone later, and I can help you through that. But some of this this morning may baffle you just a little bit because we've allowed some assumptions to take place to the story because some truths that we think are in the story just aren't in there. So a couple of assumptions about Christmas. Number one, Mary the wise man and a barn. Mary wise man and a barn. Now we think one of the assumptions is that Mary rode a donkey to Bethlehem, but there's no indication of an animal. 
I know, that's a tough truth. It's okay. It's simple. The Bible says that they went from the city of David, known as Bethlehem. It doesn't tell us how they went up to the city of David. There's no mention of a mule, a donkey, a camel, a horse. There was no piggyback ride. We don't know how Mary got to Bethlehem. We assume because she is with child that she can't walk. And so we have in our minds or over time put Mary on an animal. And that's just not in the Bible. We've assumed that our holiday tradition casts a shadow over holy. Holy Day Truth. Another assumption might be that Mary was urgently pregnant. Now there's pregnant and there's urgently pregnant. There's a doctor visit and there's an ultrasound that's done and there's positive tests and that's pregnant. And then there's the water breaking and, and, and the contractions close together and, and great pain and that is urgently pregnant. Now, I've held the hand of my beautiful wife when she was pregnant, and it was nice and sweet and kind. And I've held the wife of my, I've hand of my wife when she is urgently pregnant, and it was not so kind. <laughs> there is certainly a difference. We've come to believe that Mary was urgently pregnant, that she barely made it to Bethlehem, and as soon as they got there, she needed to deliver baby Jesus. But there's no mention of urgency. The Bible just states, while there, the time came for her to give birth. Now, she could have been to Bethlehem for five minutes or five months. There's no indication of time. But certainly, as you read the narrative, there's no panic, there's no anxiety, there's no alarm. We've made Mary urgently pregnant. Don't do that to her. It's not kind. Our holiday tradition casts a shadow over holy day truth. Another assumption might be, for some of you, this is going to hurt, that there were three wise men. There's no mention of three wise men. There's mention of wise men, there's mention of magi, but never a mention of how many. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Scripture says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the days of Herod the king, behold, three wise men, didn't say three, does it? Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. The idea that we get that there are three probably comes from Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, where these kings bring three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But again, the idea of three wise men is just an assumption. And a sidebar, if your wise men are at your nativity scene, you need to put them about three paces to the east because they haven't made it there yet. That's another sermon. Another assumption about the story that we make is that Jesus was born in a barn. Now again, there's some ambiguity here. The scripture just says in verse 7 that she laid him, Mary laid him in a manger. The assumption being that because there's a manger, which is a feeding trough, therefore it must be a barn. Well, around the world, different cultures do different things than we do things here in America or in the West. As I've traveled to South America and Southeast Asia and Central America, there's kind of a unique reality that many homes, inside their home, there's an area for animals. They could have been grazing the animals through the day, but the last thing they'll do is they'll bring them in at night to protect them. Usually it's over a roof. And it's usually inside some sort of compound or gate or even inside the actual home. And the first thing in the morning, they'll let those animals out. I've seen that with my own eyes. We in the West don't have any idea what that might be like. So it would have been very common to have feeding troughs in homes, in areas where people live. Yet we read manger, therefore it must be a barn. Don't make that assumption. The truth is we just don't know. Now, a couple other major assumptions as we kind of lean into this story just a bit more might be two more. One, the inn, and another, a fairy tale. The inn and a fairy tale. We assume that Joseph and Mary are turned away at the inn. Let's read verse 7 again. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. It makes no mention of them being turned away, yet we often assume that. Truthfully and culturally, it would probably have been highly unlikely that a Jewish woman who's with child would have been turned away at her point of need. As we know, the Jewish culture is incredibly hospitable. They are certainly very welcoming to their home to have a meal. And the case would have been that if a Jewish woman who was pregnant would have come to another Jewish home, if they could have helped her, they would have helped her. They would have not 
turned her away. In fact, if you would have done that, you probably would have been ostracized by your own society or your own community. Another assumption about the end is we think that Mary was turned away, but that in truth is there was some sort of innkeeper. Now, for some of you, I know in third grade, you played the innkeeper at your school play, and this is really a hard truth for you. I get it. It's baffling, but there's no mention of an innkeeper in this story. It just says that there was no place for them in the inn. Now, let's consider the inn itself. The inn is kind of a, a unique word. The word for inn is, uh, is very interesting because this word is only used two other places in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 22 and Matthew 14, this word is used to describe the upper room. This word, katalima, is what the disciples would have celebrated the Last Supper and the Lord's Supper with the Lord in the Catalima, in the upper room. Now, what's interesting about the inn idea that there were, in fact, inns or hotel-like accommodations within the New Testament time, but it's highly unlikely that there would have been an inn in the very small town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is not on a trade route. It's not a major city. And so the idea of having an inn or a hotel, a need for that would have been incredibly slim. Inns and hotel-like accommodations would have been in larger cities. So this word inn in Luke chapter 2 being used in other places to describe an upper room causes us to have some questions. Where else does the word inn, like an accommodation for a commercial setting, be in the scripture. Well, in Luke chapter 10, verse 34, the word for commercial lodging was used as Jesus is describing the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know this parable, the Samaritan passes by a, a victim of a robbery and he binds up his wounds and he takes him to an inn, a commercial lodging, where he speaks to an innkeeper. There is an innkeeper in that story, but not this story. And he says, I want you to do what you need to. If you spend any money, I will, I will pay back what I owe, but care for this man. Commercial lodging in is used in Luke 10. Commercial lodging in word is not used in Luke chapter 2. But the word for an upper room, another place, kind of a guest room, if you will. That's the word being used here in Luke chapter 2. Now, scholar David Caro in his book, Urban Legends of the New Testament, describe how New Testament homes look like in the Middle East. We've already described kind of an animal room. Most, rooms, most homes had a large family room, but some, room, some homes off of that family room would have another room, the Catalima, that guest room. It would have had an exterior door where people could have come and gone as they pleased. So they're there in Bethlehem looking for lodging in a Catalima, a guest room. But because the census have been taking place, the town is incredibly full. There is no room in the guest room. Luke chapter 2 verse 7 describes it best in the NIV translation when it says this, because there was no guest room available for them. So again, we need to be very careful about the truth of Christmas. We make some assumptions here. We've made some, quite a few assumptions about the whole idea and reality of the inn. The last assumption we'll make this morning is that this whole entire story is a myth. It's fake. It is, in fact, a fairy tale. I used to read to my children when they were younger, and we used to read all kinds of different books. And one of our favorite books would usually begin with Once Upon a Time. Well, as you open up Luke chapter 2, you don't read those words once upon a time. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. And what's important to know is that this word, Luke 2, this whole narrative can be trusted. Now, there are some myths out there that follow very closely with the Christmas story. A very popular myth uh, in the East is that there comes a man who was born of a virgin and he had 12 followers and he gave his life for world peace. But that's a myth that can't be substantiated. Here in the scripture, we know that what is written in the gospels can in fact be proven, that it is in fact valid and it can be trusted. We can trust the scripture for just a, a few reasons, many reasons, but a few that I'll point out today. One, that the gospels, all of them are eyewitness accounts. Either they, they were there to see what took place in the life of Jesus and how he said and what he said, or they interviewed eyewitnesses to that truth. 
Luke chapter 1, just a, a page over in my Bible, starting in verse 2, as Luke describes his gospel, beginning to lay out what he believes of the truth of the Word, and his eyewitnesses' accounts of the gospel. He says this in verse 2 of chapter 1, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some times past, to write an orderly account for you. And he's writing there to Theophilus, the idea being that this eyewitness account is important. It's not just made up. It's not fairy tale. What is in the Gospels did in fact take place. Second Peter chapter 1, this is Peter writing in his epistle. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were made known to you, the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. John, the apostle John in 1 John chapter 1 verse 1, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes. The idea, reality, that the Gospels and what's written about Jesus are eyewitnesses' accounts, therefore they can be verified and they are valid. You know, the Bible, as we examine it, proves itself over and over and over again. Jesus claimed to represent the truth. The Bible is clear that it's meant to be interpreted as truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So it's important for us to know the truth. And often there are those out there who assume that the Christmas narrative is just a myth. It's just a legend. So a couple of applications this morning. If I've already destroyed some of your Christmas decorations, and I'm sorry, let's apply this truth this morning. Well, the first application is rather simple, and the second application is going to be much deeper. But the first one is this, know the truth so you can defend the truth. Take time to separate truth from tradition, fact from fantasy. Make sure that you know the parts of the story that are in fact biblical, not just the idea or the assumptions made popular by culture or by history. Know the truth so that you can defend the truth. Know the details. Be willing to take time over these next few weeks as the Christmas reality comes to play in, in just a few weeks that you are taking time to read through Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, that you know the details of the story so you can defend it to your friends and to your peers, to your neighbors, to your coworkers. I mean, this is an incredible time to talk about spiritual things as we as a nation and as a world celebrate the birth of Jesus, whom we believe and know to be the Messiah, God's Son. Know the truth of the story that as you explain it and unpack it, you are being accurate to the text and what the Scripture says. But spiritually speaking, the Christmas narrative is not just a moment where God sends His Son to live on earth. It's not just the beginning of the gospel. It's not just the time where we're making a way for the Messiah to set the captives free. It is all of those things. But there's a nuance of application that I think sometimes we forget. We sung about it this morning. We hear of it as we read certain words. But often, I think we forget about this deeper application. Him in the flesh empowers me to hold on to faith. That Him in the flesh empowers me to hold on to faith. If you have your Bible, I'm going to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to read verses 14 through 16. And as we do so, it's important for us to understand the writer of Hebrews is beginning to make some comparisons uh, about who Jesus is against people that they would have known, specifically Moses and other heroes of the Old Testament faith. But Hebrews chapter 4 helps us understand why this Christmas story is so important for us today. Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Him in the flesh empowers me to hold on 
to faith. Now this passage calls for hope and encouragement and courage and confidence. And why is that? Because we have a priest, a mediator between us and God the Father. But the scripture describes it not just as a priest, but as a high priest, one who's been called by God to be that mediator, one who's been affirmed by God to serve as this go-between. But beyond that, the scripture describes in Hebrews chapter 4 that it's not just a priest, not just a high priest. He is a great high priest. There are lots of high priests throughout the scriptures, but there is only one great high priest. And the scripture describes why he is a great high priest. One, because he is God's son. He's not just anyone. He is Jesus, God's son. Verse 14 describes him as that. And as God's son, his home was made in heaven. He is a great high priest because of his deity. But secondly, he's a great high priest because he can identify with us. Like a coach who was once a player, Jesus understands humanity because as God's son, he was also human. The writer of Hebrews is saying Jesus is our great high priest because of his deity and his humanity. And he unpacks that a bit more in Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verses 17 and 18. And it reads this, he, speaking of Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Made like his brothers in humanity, understanding human temptation, that one day he might be the great help that we need to withstand temptation and also be the perfect substitute for the sins of humanity. This is Jesus. Now, Hebrews 4, Jesus surrenders his heavenly citizenship so that we, he might be sympathetic to our weakness, our weakness. What does that mean? Well, the scripture describes this word. It's a, it's a word that's difficult to translate, this word weakness. But if you were to do so, it's best understood as the human condition, that Jesus is sympathetic because of the human condition. Jesus, our high priest, understands what it's like to be human. He understands what it's like to be tempted. In an act of shocking, condescending love, he took on human flesh and lived out this human condition. He is sympathetic because he knows us. He's a great high priest because he knows us. Jesus coming to earth in the form of man creates for us an identity to understand that he doesn't talk about loving us. He's willing to do all he can to love us. Paul David Tripp writes this, he knows what it's like to be homeless, Jesus. He knows what it's like to be hungry, to be rejected. He's acquainted with disease and physical pain. He knows the power of accusation and injustice. He has faced the voice of temptation. He knows what it's like to be forsaken by loved ones. He understands suffering and death. He stared evil in the face. He knows us in his firsthand understanding of what we deal with day in and day out. And he does it all without sin. Never failing to human temptation. Never grieving the Holy Spirit. Always in step with the Father. It's his perfection that allowed him to be this substitute that we desperately needed. Some of you in this room have understood what it's like to be homeless, hungry, and rejected. What it's like to face evil in the what it's like to understand temptation, to be forsaken by loved ones. You get that. Can I just remind you this morning that Jesus gets that too? He is our high priest. His deity and his humanity, his ability to be sympathetic to us. This is why we should boldly, the scripture says, come to the throne of grace. Him in the flesh empowers us to hold on. It encourages us and emboldens us to come to grace. God came to us that we would come to him. And Jesus makes for that way that we would be hopeful in salvation because he has come to us in human form. So the reality for us this morning is applying Christmas means that we're running to God the way Jesus ran to us. It's an open invitation. So a question I have for you this morning, it may be the only real question I have for you today, is what hesitation... Or what causes you to hesitate to come to him? 
Because if we spent the Christmas time singing and enjoying tradition, in a few days we'll have a candlelight service, we'll have family over, you'll open presents, you'll enjoy time together. All of those things are fine. But if you have forgotten to run to him during this Christmas season, you've missed Christmas. Applying Christmas means we come to him the way he came to us. What keeps you from doing that? My family and I got an early Christmas gift a couple of weeks ago. Um, we decided it was time for another dog. And uh, we had a dog, but he was basically a grown dog before we got him, and he didn't do puppy things. Well, this one is a puppy. And his name is Finn, and Finn um, is certainly has puppy brain. And so we're trying to teach Finn certain things, certain things to do, certain things not to do, if you know what I mean. And so Finn is engaged in this new world called the Miller family. And so we call to him, and sometimes he comes to us, but sometimes he doesn't. And I don't know why Finn doesn't want to come to me. Come on, come on, buddy. I don't know why he doesn't want to come. He just looks at me like I've got three heads, and I don't understand. I'm like, hey, there's food in here. It's warm in here. Why are you, you're just pausing and looking at me, and I don't know what you need. But it caused me to think about, about that. I think the reasons, there are maybe four or five reasons Finn doesn't come to me. One, he doesn't come to me because of fear. He's done something he knows he shouldn't have done. And so there's a, there's a fear as to why he may not come to me. He comes, he doesn't come because he is selfish. He doesn't want to come. He wants to follow his nose, follow his instinct, go play, go do his own thing. Maybe he doesn't come to me because it's greed. I don't have a treat for him like I've had a treat for him in the past. And so it's like, where's my treat? I'm not coming to you unless you give me a treat. I'm convinced that the reason most of the time Finn doesn't come to me when called is because he's uncertain. He gets paralyzed by insecurity. He's not sure what I need or what I want or what he needs or what he wants. And so he's just paralyzed. And if I think about my new puppy, Finn, and I think about the Christian life, I think often we understand that there's an open invitation to come to God. Yet like Finn, we hesitate. And I think we, we hesitate for one of those four reasons. We're hesitant because of fear. We've done something wrong. We're not sure how God or Jesus is going to react to our sin. So we're afraid. We hesitate to come to God because we're selfish. We'd really rather do our own thing. We want to follow our own instinct, not be bound by anyone else's law. We hesitate to come to the Lord because we're greedy. We, in our own hearts and mind, might ask God, well, what's in it for me? Where's my treat? Where's my blessing? Why would I come to you? Because you, you don't have a blessing for me now because I'm living in some difficult pain. So where's my treat? It's because of greed that we often don't come to God. We hesitate to come to God. And just like my new dog, I think most of us are just uncertain. We're insecure. What will God think? Am I good enough? Will he want me? I don't know what to do. I'm confused. And can I just tell you that in this open invitation we call Christmas, your response to his invitation should just be yes. And in faith, you are boldly with great confidence approaching the throne of grace. Jesus came for that whole reason, for you and for me to approach God through him. And he dies on a cross that that would be able to take place. The open invitation for you this Christmas is come. Your response should be yes. And so whatever is causing you to hesitate, my prayer for you is that you would push those hesitations aside and realize that you are secure in Christ. That he's done all the hard work for you to be able to have this relationship with God. So come to his throne of grace. And I would suggest this, that it's not laws, it's, it's not this manual book of things we shouldn't do and things we, we can do when it comes to our relationship with God. It's just all grace. That by his grace, he keeps us from harm and evil by a calling us to follow his precepts and his commands. That's grace. He's helping us and guiding us along the way. So that invitation of Christmas 
for you is, yes, Lord, I'll come. He's there to provide all that you need. He understands everything within you. He sympathizes with your human condition. He knows and understands you, so come to him. And we can have this hope, we can have this healing, and the scripture says in Hebrews 4 that we can have this help, and it's all because of Christmas. The moment God sends his son Jesus is the moment that we have this bridge to have a relationship with him. It's all because of Christmas. So don't allow your, your holiday to overwhelm your holy day. Don't allow the, the fantasy of Christmas to supersede the facts of Christmas. Know the story so you can defend the story. But most of all, come to him. Him in the flesh empowers you to have faith. So find yourself there. Let's pray together. All of us in this room would recognize that it's Christmas. We see Christmas in our neighborhoods or at the office with decorations. We see Christmas with the list of to do things, to buy presents and prepare for parties. We see and understand that it's Christmas time. But have you truly received Christmas in your heart and life? And this morning, if you've never said yes to Jesus, his invitation is for you. Because Jesus came, you now have a way to have eternal life with God the Father. And that happens through faith and trusting him that he came and lived this perfect life, that he died on a cross and three days later he rose again. And the scripture simply says that those who believe and put their faith in him, they will be saved. And so this morning, if you've been about Christmas, but you've not really been of Christmas, we've got pastors and friends who just want to take time to help you understand that story and help you understand what it means to receive that invitation in faith to know Jesus. We often think that the greatest gift of Christmas is Jesus, and that certainly is. But I think for God, the greatest gift for Christmas is us receiving Jesus. And so at the, in a few moments, we're gonna have a time of singing. I invite you to do a couple of things if you'd like to receive Christ. <coughs> In the lobby, as you exit the lobby to the left, there's a place called Next Steps. We're gonna have some pastors there. We just wanna talk with you, just have a conversation, a dialogue. Not gonna embarrass you, not gonna grill you, but just wanna be there for you. And in a hand of love and encouragement, just wanna have the opportunity to talk. I invite you to step out of that place and, and just let them know, hey, I'm here to receive Jesus. I, I hear the invitation I'm, and my answer is yes. There are others in this room who know Christ, who receive Christ as Savior, and yet, if they were really honest, this Christmas season haven't taken the time to really receive that invitation. They may have received Christ in salvation, but it could be that this Christmas season, their minds and hearts are all over the place. Would you come to Jesus in confidence and receive rest, and receive peace, and be filled with hope? He wants that. And you need that. Father, all of us room, I pray that we would be men, women, boys, and girls who understand the Christmas story, not just its accuracy, but certainly its depth, its depth of what it means that Jesus came in humanity, that we might truly have life in him. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you for how he came, that we can rest in his presence for he knows us and he loves us. For my waking, stand with this church. For my daily bread, I depend on you. I'm 
depend on you. Yes, I depend on you. Thank you, Pastor Jason. I would encourage you today as we leave, if God's still stirring your heart, respond to that. Don't leave today without following what he is saying to you. There'll be pastors down here in front. Also in the foyer, we would love to connect with you. If you have not been to a small group yet, I would encourage you to do that as well. There's a team in the foyer that can help connect you to a small group study. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, it's the same service. 4 o'clock Christmas Eve, 1030 Christmas morning. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next Saturday and Sunday. You're dismissed. Hi, this is Pastor Jason, and I just want to say thank you for joining us online for our services at Geyer Springs. 
We would love to know a little bit more about you and how we can serve you and your family. We desire to connect with you. So do us a favor, grab your phone and you can click the QR code that's on the screen right now, or you can go to gsfbc.org slash check in. And there you can tell us a little bit more about who you are and how we can serve you. Again, we loved having you online. We hope we see you next week or join us in person for our worship services experience right here at Geyer Springs.